this is kind of how I do it. It's not going to be real heavy in references um, beyond my own. And uh, a few shout outs to a few people at the end. So we're going to look at the ideology and evaluation of posterior urethral stenosis. You might even say, what is posterior urethral stenosis? It's a broader term that I think is more encompassing than, say, bladder neck contracture. We all use the word bladder neck contracture. I continue to use it, but recently the terminology's changed. So this is everything from the bladder neck to the posterior urethra to the bulbar membranous urethra. We'll look at endoscopic management. There's some new things that are uh, going on that are exciting that I want to share with you. Um, talk about some of the open and robotic reconstructions, perineal reconstruction, and then go through our surgical algorithm. So in developing nations, generally you're going to see posterior urethral strictures from trauma. And in the United States, in Europe, most of the time, the stenosis these days are from radiation therapy or from surgery. I would say probably three to one in my practice, which is very different than what it was when I was getting started. We just don't see as many pelvic fractures as we used to, maybe five or six a year compared to, say, 20. I think Dr. Kim has got everyone realigned, so he's like not leaving me any business here. So brachytherapy, I think we're all familiar with that, and external beam are, are the biggest culprits, really, that I see in my practice. And brachytherapy is the gift that keeps giving. You'll see some of these strictures show up 20 years later. And it's a hard conversation with patients when you're saying, this therapy you had 20 years ago caused your stricture. Some of them just flat out don't believe it. They, they can't connect those dots. So I showed this slide earlier in one of my talks, and what are the risk factors for stricture? Well, the cardiovascular risk factors, if you have ischemia to your urethra, radiation therapy, prior transurethral resection can lead to cell death, oxidative species, collateral damage, and arteritis ischemia and stricture. So these are really hard strictures because they truly are ischemic strictures. The brachytherapy is slightly less than radical prostatectomy um, when you look at the four-year data, but I, I think that line, you can see where brachy just keeps going up. Most of the vesicle urethral anastomotic strictures, so this is a stricture at the anastomosis from your prostatectomy, you generally see those within the first year. It's rare that one would come up in a delayed fashion. So the evaluation and management, medical decision-making, it's the same as any stricture evaluation. Maybe with the um, addition of urodynamics. So many of these patients show up with both incontinence and stricture, and many of them have erectile dysfunction as well. So uh, they become a, a patient that I get to know well because they have a number of issues that we may be managing. But urodynamics, um, I only do if there's a history of incontinence. Sometimes you can't get the catheter in, but we at least like to try that. Cystoscopy and retrograde urethrography. I don't usually do an MRI unless they have pelvic bone pain or something to suggest pubic osteo. So let's talk about surgical treatment, right? We're all surgeons here. We like to talk about surgery. So let's jump into it. This is an algorithm that I created for the AUA when we wrote the update series. And you could see Dr. Terlecki and Kozlov, Nick Lavosky, and a few of the other fellows were contributing. And, and a lot of this work that Ryan added when he was in his practice or is in his practice in Wake Forest. So we, we spent a lot of time developing these algorithms, trying to make them as clear and concise as we can. They're all available to you in the update series. I'm happy to share that. But we're generally going to try a dilation or an incision. We'll do that as much as two times. If that doesn't work, we may go to an antifibrotic agent. If that doesn't work, lower urinary tract reconstruction. And then in some patients, we even need to do urinary diversion. And urinary diversion is usually going to be based more on bladder dysfunction than a problem with the stricture, but there are some patients that do need to be diverted. So what about endoscopic techniques? How many people here do endoscopic techniques for urethral stricture? Yeah, pretty much anybody, right? You meet that patient in the ER, you're on call. How many people do urethroplasties? Okay, and that, that number is growing. When I used to ask that question, it'd be one or two people. So certainly um, endoscopic treatment is a big part of what we do. Uh, I prefer to treat the patient in the office if I can with dilation, especially during COVID. A lot of our stricture cases were tier three at our hospital, and we had to be pretty creative in what we were doing in the office. Um, some patients refuse to be dilated awake, I'll take them to the OR. If I can't dilate, then I'll take them to the OR and cut with the laser most of the time. 
So there's a lot of different ways of doing this, hot knife, cold knife, laser, you can resect tissue, you can inject antifibrotic agents. And, and what does the data show? And a lot of this is really dealer's choice. I think we get comfortable doing it a certain way, that's the way you were trained, maybe that's the technology available at your hospital. So post-radical prostatectomy, I always uh, stress to the residents and fellows to cut at three and nine, right? Don't cut at six o'clock, you got the rectum there. Don't cut at 12 o'clock, that's where the pubic bone is. So three and nine o'clock is generally where we like to cut. And these are gonna be deep cuts into fat. Typically I'll use a thulium laser. I like that because it's a little faster than homium, um, but certainly homium is fine uh, as well. I leave the catheter in, as John mentioned, just a few days. I think there's an idea if you leave the catheter in longer, maybe that'll improve the outcome. There's no data to support that. So this is a, a transurethral incision case. You can see the green light on the left. And you might say, why would you need green light for stricture? Well, if the patient's prostate is in sight to, sometimes this is fibrotic prostate tissue. And I used to use green light, but green light focuses in on hemoglobin. And a lot of these prostates are ischemic. It's not BPH tissue, it's fibrotic tissue. Thulium is a better kind of all-purpose laser. So I do need to change this slide out, but I used to use green light in the prostate for these sort of cases. Now, thulium, you can both vaporize the prostate and treat stricture. So this is an animation that David Kozlov uh, put together. Um, and you can see uh, how we will cut first and then inject at three and nine. This is hard. Sometimes the tissue is very fibrotic. You're injecting. The fluid's coming right back at you. I'm comfortable injecting steroid. I've never been really comfortable injecting mitomycin. I'd be interested to hear what Ryan has to say maybe later about that. I know he has some experience, but there's been some severe complications reported with mitomycin, so I've always been, been hesitant. The data is all over the place. Certainly, uh, none of us believe that a dilation works 100% of the time, but I, I put this slide up sort of uh, to, to show what some people report. I think the longer you follow these patients, the more likely you're going to see recurrence. So uh, the mitomycin, I'm just going to touch on real brief um, regarding complications that people have seen. And, and is it really the mitomycin, or was this patient going down that path anyway? Maybe they had severe bladder dysfunction, radiation, dystrophic calcifications, and the mitomycin might have been the final uh, event in the process. But um, there's a number of publications, the one from that David Kozloff put together with Dr. Terlecki, and, and that's one that I quote with patients, but I haven't really gotten on the mitomycin C bandwagon. Sean Elliott contacted me before this meeting and said, Brian, you have to put in Optolume. I saw that you're presenting there. Can, can you present some of this data? He was the lead on this, um, did three clinical trials, and I said, sure, if you have it published, I'm happy to present on that. So this is a picture of the Optolume balloon. So it's not urolume, it's not metallic, it's not permanent. This is basically balloon dilation with a steroid or an antifibrotic agent attached to this. So how many people do balloon dilation of the urethra? Yeah, once in a while. How, pe how many people use filiforms and followers? Cook S-curve dilators? Okay, Van Buren sounds? Yeah, so I mean, we all do it a little bit different. I think balloons were very popular and then we realized they were expensive and weren't working any better than maybe what we were doing. Um, and, and sometimes you couldn't fully inflate the balloon. The idea of this balloon is, is very similar to what they do in angioplasty, right? So you balloon a cardiac vessel, you have an anti-fibrotic agent on that, and can you improve your outcomes? So um, I, I'm new to this technology. I've never done a single one of these procedures. It is now FDA approved, and I think patients are probably going to ask you about it. So I, I at least wanted to introduce the topic. The data looks quite good. Um, like a lot of new medical devices, you'll see early data being encouraging. Um, and if you're getting a 75% improvement at 36 months, that's approaching the results of what you'd get with urethroplasty. This is a highly selected patient population, so strictures less than two centimeters. 80, 90% of the strictures are not radiated, so they're from benign causes. And in the overwhelming majority of the patients are in the bulbous urethra. So this study is not necessarily approved for penile urethra or bladder neck. So I mentioned um, the success rate, adverse events. You will see some adverse events. Most of them are minor, hematuria, infection, penile pain, 
Um, you know, so that adds up to a big number, 39%, but most of these are, are pretty minor. It's, it's a balloon. I don't see this necessarily causing harm, but will it pass the test of time? What about suprapubic catheter? John did a nice job mentioning suprapubic catheters, and I remember, you know, having it beat, beaten into my head as a resident that suprapubic catheters are, are evil. And then in my fellowship, I was told I'm giving up, you know, if I put a suprapubic. But... We all do it, right? It, it's sometimes the best therapy for some older patients that aren't candidates for reconstruction. How many people do suprapubic catheters? Right, I mean, so I, I've had people say, I never do it, I'm like, ah, I'm not sure about it. So people do suprapubic, it's often in someone that can't do self-cath, especially acute retention after cryo or after a resection. You may wanna be careful, maybe that Foley catheter can go in the wrong location. So I think especially early on after high food, cryo, they do all these therapies at my hospital, I might put a suprapubic in the patient. If they object to that, I'll put a Foley, I might even do it under direct vision, but I'm not necessarily comfortable with them doing CIC. Many of them don't wanna do it early on because it's too, just too painful. Chronically, um, Alan Mori and his group published on use of this and people that weren't able to be reconstructed, most of the patients were over 80. He'd intentionally let them close down. That would resolve their incontinence, and they'd live with the chronic suprapubic catheter. Okay, can we do better, though? Can we do something other than suprapubic or an optolum uh, balloon? And, and what's the algorithm? So I, I took some pictures out of the, the update we did. Um, Vesicourethral and astomotic stricture is a new term that I encourage you to use. I think we want to speak the same language when we're talking about strictures. And I have a lot of experience doing this open, and now I've transitioned to doing these robotically. Um, this was one of the first series that we published, um, 12 cases. And uh, it's amazing we got this published with only 12 cases, but there just wasn't a lot of data. So if you're gonna publish something on a topic most people don't write about, you can probably get a publication with 12 patients. And we had really good results. The problem was it took a long time we had pretty significant blood loss in a few cases, prolonged convalescence, but we had a 92% success, meaning they were stricture-free, 25% incontinence. So what, what did this look like? So this is a patient that I did probably 15 years ago. You can see complete obliteration of the vesica urethral anastomosis. You can see that both cystoscopically and on your up and downogram. So when you do these open, the problem is that pubic bone and the pubic bone really gets in your way. Uh, Waterhouse described pubectomy, right? So partial pubectomy, transpubic repair. And now I can see that pretty well. That's my sound coming through the urethra after I remove part of the pubic bone with the bone saw. But that's hard work, and, and that's a lot of recovery for the patient. I show this really more for historic reasons. I, I can't remember the last time I did pubectomy. And I think if you take two things away from any of the reconstructive talks, in the last 20 years of my career, really robotics and buccal mucosa have really changed our specialty. Those have been the two biggest advances by far. So this is the patient I, I reconstructed uh, and we got a nice outcome. But what about robotics? We're starting to see some case reports on doing these robotics. It started kind of around 2015, 2018. And I, I think if people are doing the original surgery robotically, why? can't you possibly do the revision surgery robotically? It's no different. Well, because the reconstructive surgeons weren't robotic surgeons, the oncologists were. So they would send the patient to their colleague who doesn't do robotics and then they got a big open operation. And, and now we're gradually starting to see a transition of more and more reconstructive surgeons doing robotics. This is a publication from the Turns collaboration. This is the largest uh, publication here. In this paper, they didn't totally disconnect the anastomosis, so uh, a partially transecting technique, if you will, advancing the anterior bladder wall. Very similar to Margit's T-plasty. This is just more of a Y to V-plasty on the anterior wall instead of the posterior wall. Um, this operation here that I do with buccal mucosa, um, I first described this using for bladder neck contracture after BPH. We presented at Jackson Hole meeting a few years ago. This video is available in uh, Gold Journal and on YouTube. I show this to say this is not what I do for vesicular urethral and asthmatic stenosis. I do essentially an EPA. I do this more for longer strictures, mostly related to BPH surgery. So what about bulbar membranous urethral stricture? 
Bulbar membranous urethral stricture is a stricture that really starts at the membranous urethra, typically where the radiation struck that area, and then extends into the membranous urethra. This is a very delicate area. This is where the continence mechanism is. So what operations do we have available? Well, I, I get this all the time. My doctor sent me to you because he was worried that if we did the urethroplasty, I would be incontinent. And so that's, that's a real concern. Let's talk about that. And, and you know what will that look like and how bad are you bothered by the stricture? Can we have a solution if we do cause incontinence afterwards? So if you look at Alamori's data, I think this is some of the best data you'll see on EPA uh, for bulbar membranous strictures. Really good success rate, 86% in a radiated field. That is a good success rate. The problem was incontinence, 35% stress incontinence. And when you completely mobilize the urethra, skeletonize the urethra, you might have a successful operation, the patient's incontinent, and what's gonna be the future outcome for your artificial urinary sphincter now placed around an ischemic urethra? So I do everything I can not to do an EPA in the posterior urethra because I'm worried about incontinence and how am I gonna manage this. This is a multi-institutional study that Al put together, and you can see that number, 40% incontinence after EPA in the posterior urethra in the radiated patient. So, uh, Dimitri, um, Nick Lovosky was a fellow with us a few years ago, and I'm sure everybody who's in academics has experienced this. Dimitri was encouraging me to use buccal mucosa in the posterior urethra. And I said, Dimitri, no one's ever done that before. And he's like, well, why don't you be the first one? I said, well, why don't you be the first one? You're almost graduated. And do a bunch of cases, write it up and publish it, and then maybe I'll consider it. And he said, fine, I'll do it. So he did it. 16 patients that he was able to reconstruct in the posterior urethra and use buccal mucosa in the posterior urethra. And I remember asking George Webster, can we use buccal there? No, we don't use buccal in the posterior urethra. That was the dogma really in the 90s and even probably into the 2000s that buccal mucosa had no role in the posterior urethra. People would say, what's the graft bed? Where is this graft getting its blood supply? So th these are some pictures from his publication. These are long strictures, sometimes as long as six centimeters. Um, and this is some animation that he put together. He's got a nice video available uh, on YouTube that I sometimes will show to patients. I think we all know how to do, and see the plenty of slides on urethroplasty, so I won't spend too much time there. But you know, this is one of the patients that I did, and after Dimitri published his study, he set up an international uh, group of surgeons, and we had 70 patients, 10 sites, and we were basically able to reproduce his results. So, now we have 10 centers doing buccal mucosa in the posterior urethra. And you could see that the success rate was pretty similar to the Mori paper and the Meeks paper, somewhere around 83% success. But most importantly, our incontinence rate, sure, it was still around 40, but 30% were incontinent going into the surgery. So we only had a 10% de novo stress incontinence rate compared to 30% with EPA. So that's a big difference. Now granted, I'm still gonna to have to do quite a bit of artificial sphincters, but at least now the urethra hasn't been mobilized, okay, uh, around where my cuff site's gonna be. So 79 patients treated, 21-month um, follow-up, 83% success, 8.1% de novo SUI. What else can you do? This is a paper from Alex Vani. Some people would suggest using buccal mucosa with a gracilis flap. The problem with this operation is grafts and flaps they don't usually go well together. It's kind of one or the other, and, and I don't like the idea of throwing a graft on a flap and depending on that for its blood supply. So I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit here just so I don't go over. Um, the AUA update, I'm happy to share with anybody, uh, but Ryan and I were talking the other night. He was telling me how his residents prepare for cases. He says they don't read textbooks. They don't look at atlases. They go to YouTube, right? So you can go to YouTube and take a, take a look at some of these videos and look at um, the channel. Craig's gonna, he's gonna subscribe, right? I'm gonna get 11? I'll subscribe. All right, I got 10 subscribers now. Hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll be up to 11. You said you're gonna do it. I know that sounds shameless, but. Tell my friends too. Yeah, tell your friends. And, and, and uh, Bill back there with Grand Rounds in Urology. Um, so when I do this on my own, I get about 100 hits. The YouTube's, they recorded at this meeting with Grand Rounds in Urology, over 4,000 hits on those videos. Now, Bill hasn't given me all his secrets, but he told me earlier that you start hitting this exponential phase where if you get past 100, right? Like if you look at a restaurant that has two reviews, you don't even read them. 
because there's two reviews. And this sort of stuff works the same way. But if you want the long version of this lecture, that's, that's the first one. Um, I'm going to skip over the bladder preservation stuff just so we don't go over time. And I just want to give a, a couple shout outs here um, at the end. Um, I couldn't have done this with some of the reconstructive urology fellows that I've had. We've got a number of them here. Alexander Berg over there, Lisa Perillo, Ryan Terlecki. Sometimes gives me some credit. He gives most of the credit to Al Mori, but we'll get over that. Uh, but the person, the person I really want to thank um, is my family. So this is one of the few meetings that you can literally, this picture was taken two hours ago. Okay, and my daughter emailed me to it and she said, Dad, hey, why don't you put this in your PowerPoint? That might look cool. So yeah, you, we work hard, we play hard. We have an adopted son there. Uh, one of the Turlecki boys joined us, so that was, that was fun. And this is all the way up on the top, as high as you really can get. And the main person is Dr. Kim. He gave a lecture today about his life at the county hospital. And I go to the county one day a month. I don't know if I could handle more than more than that. Maybe one day a week, perhaps. This guy's been doing it five days a week, along with Beth Schulte, for more than 20 years. And at the same time, running this meeting, it's tremendous. And uh, it's great to see everyone back here in person. And thanks, Fernando and Beth, for the invitation and the opportunity.